talk about lifting, but I'll have a presentation. OK. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. So um, let me start with some motivation from cohomology theories. So we'll start with a, a smooth projective variety over Q. Um, and the, the Kähler structure on, on X gives um, a Hodge filtration. And um, so we have this decomposition of cohomology. And um, I'm going to let HPQ be this, this dimension. So um, these so-called Hodge numbers are important invariants of, um, of the variety. Um, and just as an example, um, if X is an abelian variety of dimension G, then um, both these, so the Hodge numbers are G and G. And, um, and also the Hodge filtration, um, along with the rational structure, determines X up to isogeny. So this is, uh, the Hodge filtration is a uh, powerful invariant. OK, so now let me um, move to QP coefficients, which is the main subject of the talk. So um, we can also define the atoll cohomology of, of X. Um, and I'm going to let that be HI. And since X was defined over, over Q, um, we get a, an action of the absolute Galois group of, of Q. Um, so, so this is an important invariant. For example, um, one can recover um, point counts, so the number of points on X mod L um, from the Gerth and Dieck-Lefschetz trace formula. OK. So, um, so now let me um, mention just two results about HI, uh, both due to faultings. So, um, so the first one is about using HI to recover the Hodge numbers that we saw from the last slide. So for this purpose, um, let me introduce this, this uh, module ZP twisted by 1. So it's defined as follows. Here, mu p infinity is the, um, the group of p power roots of unity. Um, so as, an, as a group, it's just non-canonically isomorphic to uh, qp mod zp. And so um, as an abelian group, this is just um, zp. Um, zp1 is just zp. But um, mu p infinity has um, a Galois action. And um, that gives zp1 a Galois action. So ZP1 will always be um, a Galois module. OK. So, um, so faultings prove the following um, piatic Hodge decomposition. So if I tensor this HI um, by the completion of the um, algebraic closure of QP, then it decomposes as follows. So, um, so these. H, P, X, omega, Q are the, um, the sheet cohomology groups we saw in the last slide. Um, so CP minus Q just means I'm twisting by um, um, ZP1 to the, minus, to the minus Q tensor power. OK. So, um, so on the left-hand side, um, the absolute Galois group of QP acts um, diagonally. And on the right-hand side, it only acts on the, um, the right factor. And um, the important thing about this decomposition is that um, it's equivariant with respect to this Galois action. Um, and an old theorem of Tate says that the CP minus Qs are distinct as Galois modules um, for different Q. And so from this, we can recover the Hodge numbers. Um, so two pieces of notation that will be important. Yeah. The proof of this is in how they're defending it, the classical you know, part of the I, th I th there, are, there are proofs that are entirely independent. Um, I, th I think this was, I think his was as well, but I'm not sure. Um, okay. So uh, okay. So some notation that will be relevant later in the talk. So um, so I'll let lambda be um, 
a multiset with minus q appearing hpq times. So um, you can think of lambda as just being equivalent information to uh, the Hodge numbers. And um, so lambda will be called the, the Hodge Tate weights of HI. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that if x has good reduction at p, then um, this, this Gower representation HI has this um, special technical property of being crystalline. And um, one should imagine that the converse is morally true, even though um, not literally true. Um, and then finally, there's a similar theorem to um, Riemann's theorem in the complex case. So if x is an abelian variety, then h1 determines x up to isogeny. OK. So, um, so that's all I wanted to say about cohomology. Um, so um, complex geometers often just forget the variety and work with the Hodge structure. And um, they consider variations of Hodge structure. Um, number theorists often do the same thing with Gower representations. So we're going to forget x from now on, and we're going to look at deformations of the Gower representation. So, um, so row bar will be a mod p Gower representation of the absolute Gower group of QP. Um, and I'm going to let this space x lambda row bar. Again, this has nothing to do with the x that appeared earlier. Um, this is going to be um, the space of um, characteristic zero Galois representations, which are crystalline, have Hodge state weights lambda, and um, are congruent to row bar modulo the, um, the maximal ideal. Okay. Um, so, so this is a very important object in, um, in in the in the piatic Langlands program, or um, even the the usual Langlands program. So um, one question which comes up in the um, Taylor Wiles patching method is how many connected components does this deformation space have? Um, so this is in the so, so this is an analytics a rigid analytic space. So this is in rigid analytic sense. Um, so this question is, uh, as far as I know, open for even GL2, so when n is 2. Um, so I'll have nothing to say about this question. Um, an even simpler question is just, when is this space non-empty? Um, and actually, this has a rather satisfactory answer in the case n equals 2, um, which motivates the rest of this talk. Um, but before I move on to that, let me. Um, let me just discuss the case of n equals 1. So, um, so let's let rho bar be this one-dimensional Gower representation. So you can either think of this as the reduction of zp twisted by a, or more concretely, it's just um, mu p to the tensor a power as a, as a Gower module. OK. So, um, Essentially, by Fermat's little theorem, we, we know that um, FPA is the same as FPB if and only if A and B are congruent mod P minus 1. Um, so, if, so, so in this case, lambda is just a single number. So we'll just, by abusive notation, identify lambda with that integer. So lambda and A are congruent mod P minus 1 if and only if um, this deformation space is not empty. Um, one implication is easy to show because um, QP twisted by lambda is clearly a lift of um, FPA. Um, and when it's not empty, then it's just, uh, just given by ZP bar. Uh, essentially, this comes from um, the behavior of Fabanius. OK, so um, this gives a complete answer to both of these questions um, in the case n equals 1. OK, so to answer this question, um, it's convenient to have a notion of um, a weight mod p. So, um, so recall that lambda is just uh, some multiset of integers. So that's um, equivalent to an irreducible representation of GLM by highest weight theory. So that motivates um, the following definition. 
So a Serre weight is just uh, an isomorphism class of an irreducible mod p representation of GLN fp. I'll, I'll forget the fact that it's an isomorphism class um, for the rest of this talk. So, um, so if n equals 1, then the Serre weights are just powers of the standard representation. Um, and um, note that the, the eighth power of the standard representation is the same as the bth power if and only if a and b are the same mod p, p minus 1. So this gives, uh, so one can reformulate um, the last slide as saying that this deformation space is non empty if and only if um, the lambda power is the same as the eighth power of the standard representation. Um, so this, this motivates um, the next slide. So, um, so we expect some compatibility of notions of weights in characteristic zero and p. Um, so from now on, I'm going to assume that uh, lambda is regular. So, so what that means is that either you can either think of that as being the fact that the Hodge numbers are um, all uh, less than or equal to one, or um, lambda is just an honest set, so all its elements are distinct. Um, and then eta will be, uh, okay, so from now on, we're going to think about um, lambda as a dominant character of GLN just by writing the integers in decreasing order. And here, eta is another um, dominant character of GLN. And um, to lambda, we can associate this um, algebraic representation, v lambda minus eta of GLN. So this is the irreducible representation with highest weight, lambda minus eta. And notice that by the regularity assumption, lambda minus eta will still be, still be dominant. Um, and so this will replace our notion of, um, of weight in characteristic zero. So it's, it's equivalent information. Um, OK, so the conjecture is that um, if we start with a mod p Gower representation, um, there's some set of Serre weights, which I'll call w of rho bar, um, such that uh, this deformation space is not empty if and only if um, the following intersection of sets is not empty. Um, so this is some compatibility between notions of weights um, by reduction. Um, and let me point out that, so in char characteristic zero, we just had one irreducible representation, v lambda minus eta. Um, in char characteristic p, we'll often have, uh, we'll have a set. So we'll have a set of irreducible representations. Um, but this gives a simple criterion for um, when the deformation space is not empty. You can say what set of weights lambda is. I think so. Uh, uh, so a Serre weight is just an irreducible representation of, um, of GLNFP, mod P. Okay. Um, so. So this conjecture is known when n equals 1. Um, so this was uh, mentioned in a previous slide. So if rho bar is fp um, twisted by a, then we can just take the set of weights to be the, um, the eighth power of the standard representation. Um, more interestingly, uh, it also holds for, it also holds when n equals 2. And this is, um, this really uses the full strength of the um, piatic Langlands correspondence of Colmes for GL2QP. OK. Um, so let me now describe some partial progress in higher dimensions. So, um, so the, there's a recent result that says that um, if n equals 3, then there is such a, a weight set which gives one implication. Um, and furthermore, um, the converse holds in what's called the potentially diagonalizable case. So instead of saying what that means, I'll just say that um, K 
conjecturally, every crystalline representation is uh, potentially diagonalizable. So, um, I mean, that's probably a hard conjecture, but at least reassuring. Um, and what does generic mean? oh, yes, generic. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I won't have. Well, so if rho bar is uh, the direct sum of um, representations of the form, say, FPA, FPB, FPC, and so on, then it's saying that um, A, B, C, and so on are, are far apart. Um, OK. Um, yes. OK, and, and then the, the full converse holds in um, a certain a certain case. So when lambda is eta and um, there's a s tamely potentially crystalline just means almost crystalline. So it's a slight relaxing. But um, so this last clause isn't so important other than um, the fact that it determines what w of rho bar is. So um, so if there is a w of rho bar, then it's the one in this theorem. Um, and then another another result. So if Rho bar is semi-simple and generic. Um, OK, and now n will be arbitrary. Um, so there exists uh, an, some set w question mark, which is conjecturally actually w of rho bar. And the conjecture holds in the, um, again, the tamely potentially crystalline case. Um, OK. so. That's about as much as known currently in higher dimensions. Um, so there, there are many open conjectures and questions. Um, but let me close with um, a question which, for which there's no conjectural answer as far as I know. So um, the entire time we've been asking, uh, we've been um, confining ourselves to the, the case when lambda is regular. So, um, so what does one do if lambda is not regular? I'll stop there. <laughs>